Well, good evening, everybody. <clears throat> welcome to the Royal Asiatic Society, and still more welcome to the Terminos Academy. Um, one of the moments I always look forward to in the autumn is the opportunity to introduce Jeremy Reed and one of his wonderful talks, lectures, performances, readings, a facet of all of those. Um, choose what you will. Um, in the last couple of years, I've um, been working on Jeremy's poetry, and I have read at least 50 volumes of his poems, dating from the 1960s <laughs> up to the present day. And <clears throat> the experience has strengthened my view that Jeremy is probably the most important poet of my generation, um, often overlooked, sometimes vilified, but nonetheless, um, he has a body of work which is unmatched, I think, in, in my generation and in this country. So um, it's always a great delight to introduce him. He's one of those poets who should be read by other poets as well as by general readers. And Jeremy is also one of the earliest members of the publishing group which surrounded and contributed to the original Temenos journal. Um, he was a close friend of Kathleen's and a fellow poet. Um, and so it's particularly exciting and I'm particularly delighted that Jeremy has agreed to give us a talk about his friendship with Kathleen Wayne. Um, which I think will give us a tremendous insight into one of the key points of creativity in the second half of the 20th century. So I'm delighted to introduce Jeremy, who's going to speak on the Poets Thank Academy you, at 47 much. Paulton Square, personal friendship of Kathleen Lane and Jeremy Reed. Thank, Thank you, you very Jeremy. much. To meet Kathleen Rain, I was first confronted by a lion's head, the slightly oxidised brass door knocker <laughs> featured on the aluminium painted door to 47 Porton Square. The significance of this imposing solar guardian, I was to learn later, characteristically imported from Blake, dictum, the wrath of the lion is the wisdom of God. The simmering July heat mixed with an edgy quotient of whiffy white noise off the King's Road <coughs> consolidated my nervousness. Standing in this Georgian terrace garden square in Chelsea, a thrown look from World's End as punk attractor, and at last at the smudged card strip on the door annunciator simply read Madge without Kathleen preceding it. I was there eyes pitted with black eyeliner, relatively new to London, through the intermediary of David Gascoigne, who'd sent Kathleen my poems, soon after the beginnings of our close friendship, optimally enhanced by our shared belief in Andre Breton's pioneering iconoclastic pointer, poetry in the service of the revolution. David, who hadn't published a book for 25 years, was contemporaneous with emerging from a black, solid mass of depression and episodic memory loss due to electroconvulsive shock, starting to be rediscovered, not only as an urban visionary, but for the seminal role he had played in the first wave of 1930s surrealism, in which uncensored imaginative autonomy pushed hard to subvert formal modes of literary expression. When the door opened, a dark-suited Kathleen, a single brooch as accessory, her blue eyes liquid with twinkling catchlights, I knew her to be in her early seventies, stood back momentarily, taking me in with her inhalation, and said carefully to me, Yes, Jeremy, real poets are always beautiful. Do come in. I went into a green hall dominated by Cecil Collins's artwork. I didn't know, she told me and straight into a kitchen, heady, resinous and tangy with the rum-drenched, currant-eyed fruitcake she'd baked for my visits. 
and asked me to choose a tea from a line of chunky tin canisters. And being me, I selected, much to her approval, the pine smoky tannins of Lapsang Souchong. By the kitchen door, open on a sunken garden, there was a box of jet black pansies, true black rather than purple, a tip to her scientific knowledge of botany as something lived and known as the organic extension of her core mysticism. What am I inventing by remembering, or remembering by inventing, and how do I recognise the dissolve? I was there, and I'm writing this now. And I can't run time backwards, only resituate events in the present, as though I can physically place Kathleen's 160 pounds seated in a lived-in, partially shabby green armchair in front of you, as she sat facing me in July circa 1981. But I did sit facing her. The time travelled lemony sunshine filtering through with photonic clarity. I had a notebook with me, <clears throat> by which I mean I'm mobile. I write anywhere and everywhere, in cafes, in buses, planes on the street, in public spaces, walking. I mean, it's always there, the language I need to make poetry. And Kathleen there, as I describe her, and she was naturally curious about what I was writing and asked me if I would read her some new poems. What I have with me as work in progress was a section of my first novel, The Lipstick Boys, a fictionalised assemblage of my deeply traumatised teens in Jersey, in which I was socially outlawed for my pop star looks and disaffection from normal, and in the process sent from one dumb dystopian psychiatrist to another, sampling anti-anxiety drugs that made me weirder. As an antidote to toxic psychiatry, I played Lou, record, Lou Reed records very loud and immersed myself in the imploded cut-up of Burroughs's naked lunch. I stalled on reading it, telling Kathleen the contents were too personally disturbing and in need of revision, but she insisted I go ahead, qualifying extreme psychology as integral to visionary poetics. My descriptive passages of marine atmospheric sea fog aqueously colliding with rainbow halos led into descriptions of an older gay man, Nifty Jim, being brutally gang-beaten for wearing red lipstick and to other same-sex persecutions, of which I noticed Kathleen was discreetly extinguishing tears. And when I stopped reading, she was adamant she was not only going to find a publisher for the book, but introduce it. She immediately called her friend Alan Clodd, who had published a number of her books, and David Gascoigne's from Enotharm and Press, and told Alan not only that he was going to publish it, but that she would supply an introduction, as she liked the idea of risk in supporting my subculture. As the afternoon deepened rather than progressed, Kathleen spoke of the Androgyne as the archetype most conducive to imaginative creativity, and how, in accordance with her belief in the perennial philosophy, she'd largely renounced the heteronormative world for the intellectual refinement of gay men, the likes of Rupert Doom, Francis Bacon, Patrick White, David Gascoigne, Robert Duncan, Gavin Maxwell, James Merrill, etc., all of whom contributed significantly to her psychic diagram of altered sexuality as integrated into the Jungian concept of the mandala telling me too, and much later in our friendship, that she too felt she inhabited bisexual consciousness as an aspect of her psyche. She'd left two husbands, Hugh Sykes Davis and Charles Madge, committed her two children, James and Anna, to the care of her friend and patron, Helen Sutherland, and totally liberated herself into the pursuit of poetry, collateral to her self-appointed post, as she called it, secretary to William Blake. What more can you offer? The romantic quest of poetry as quantum unifier or the quotidian banality of raising children? There is only one option, poetry. The penumbral guilt of deserting her children that ate into Kathleen's nerves later in life was a persistent, wrung-out obsession that we went over and over together in the attempt to lessen her irrational sense of guilt 
at letting her children down in ways that became an augmented, inventive fiction. Kathleen was vociferously anti-feminist, and while personally abdicating the role of mother and forming what she called a spiritual family of friends, she insisted on women's role being domestic and not creative, arguing that women genetically had failed to create poetry comparable in her estimates to her male archetypal heroes, Dante, Shakespeare, Blake, Shelley, and her contemporary ideals like St. John Perth, David Jones, and David Gascoigne. She considered woman inferior in biochemical aspects of creativity, arguing that the optimal qualities of femininity would be, were to be discovered in the male androgyne, who was more adept at exploiting the duality than his female counterpart, her masculine aspect. Her profound studies of Plotinus, and she insisted on giving me a beautiful green and gilt edition of his treatise on beauty, the alchemically-based psychology of C.G. Jung, Burma, Blake, and the whole mystic genealogy right up to Crowley, Corbin, and James Hillman, consolidated her thesis that male androgyny, Proust, of course, included, was the bronchial plexus that motivated creative autonomy. Seeing in me an addition to her claimed genealogy, she insisted soon after we met I read all of Proust as confirmation of my own self-identity and would sometimes visit Peter Jones, the retail outlet at nearby Sloan Square, and buy me scents I had come to personalise, like Gelin Le Bleu and the tropical grass-saturated vetiver, admiring like me its maker, Jacques Gelin's aesthetic Japanophilia, expressed in the subtle character of Mitsuku, in which the girl's tragic personality is the genie in the scent. Kathleen herself used a scent from Image Door, the woman's clothes shop in Palm Place, Chelsea, where she bought XL dresses and suits, usually accompanied by her close friend, Setters Blacker. While Kathleen's schematic for the androgyne, nominalising the adjective androgynous, was derived formatively from Plato's Symposium, in which homosexuality is correspondingly idealised as a Socratic component of androgyny, I was able, without resistance on her part, to introduce contemporary pop looks as a continuity of the state into her awareness, the likes of Mick Jagger, David Bowie, Michael Jackson and Annie Lennox, in which masculine and feminine characteristics provided an extended culture of gender ambiguity. She herself remarked to me often and enthusiastically on the lurid cerise, turquoise, flamingo, emerald, scarlet, punk, hairdos she regularly saw when out shopping on the King's Road, particularly at Waitrose, her preferred, preferred supermarket. One afternoon when I visited her, and a rare day on which she'd actually been paid for something, she told me she'd given a wad of cash to a junkie in a doorway, telling me she thought it was better to live in altered state reality than in the corporate system she so despised, quoting Blake, quote, those who do not have light in their face shall never become stars. Nobody had better integrated the molecular exhaust of Blake's prophetic writings than Kathleen Rain, both in the ga galaxy of its inner pathways, but also through the architectonics of London, the city in which Blake lived and out of which he built the import of his post-apocalyptic realities, the great seething whirl of plasma he called, quote, a fortuitous concourse of memories accumulated and lost. There was no doubt in Kathleen's mind or in mine, again utilising Blake, quote, the imagination is not a state, it is the human existence itself. When we first met, she'd been advised to slow down on account of a tired heart, a diagnosis she was to refute by engaging in relentlessly active work for another two decades using homeopathically dosed hawthorn as a natural vasodilator and whiskey to promote circulation. She'd already fired all of the three initially contributing editors to Temenos in order to assert singular control over the contents, never compromised in anything she did, and objected with impassioned defiance to any opposition to her literary beliefs. 
She created enemies in the same way that she attracted friends, caring nothing for the consequences, and asking me on my visits to read through poetry submitted to Temenos. I was told to bin contributions by women and generally discard most submissions as substandard. Ted Hughes's poems were rejected with a long accompanying letter by Kathleen arguing that he was unable to personalise humans without converting them shamanically into animals and that he failed her poetic criterion on these grounds. Jeffrey Hill's poems were similarly thrown out as spurious for what she called, quote, religious rather than visionary impulse. And my attempts to argue a case for Tom Gunn was flattened by her dismissal of adolescent themes for biker boys. While she willingly published Robert Duncan, Allen Ginsberg and Gary Snyder, my appeal for John Ashbury met with a rejection of unfocused Disneyland. And once Kathleen began drinking at 5.30, often forwarded to 5 on my visits, drink being unmeasured tumblers of scotch diluted fractionally with mineral water, her denigration of most existing reputations in literature was habitual practice of downsizing individuals she thought detrimental to her personal view of a psychological type she insisted to be representative of poetry. Kathleen, like most drinkers, serious drinkers, like both the excitatory and sedative effects of alcohol on the brain's rewards symptoms, and drank not only whiskey, teachers, Glen Fittich, famous grouse, Isle of Dura, if friends brought it as gifts, but wine and an aperitif called Punta Mez, an Italian vermouth characterised by one point of sweetness and half a point of bitterness, halfway between Rosso Vermouth and Campari. She disliked people who didn't drink and was open about it, seeing alcohol more as an inspirer than the present, and in our friendship, a loosener to peeling away some of the layers of personal guilt she felt able to confide in me. Her own profound understanding of inner states, particularly breakdown, emotional grief, loss, death, the anomalous and often acutely disturbing realities explored by poets, and the alienation experienced by those whose gifts differ from the demands of quantitative materialism, would have made her, to my mind, an exceptional Jungian analyst, as well as a poet. Booze is a good fixative for my personal recollections of Kathleen, for much of what she told me was over-drink and synaptic rather than linear. I'm writing this sitting outside in Leicester Square. There's a crystal sugar skull of rain clouds building over the Piccadilly entrance to the square, and a young busker riffing into a beat-up version of the Beatles' Here Comes the Sun that isn't going to send an acid days John Lennon back from the future. I'm crumbling tuk, 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 grains of white Indian Valium into my palm as a habituated user, while a Thai girl sitting next to me who has been periodically remarking on my handwriting tells me that she's called Orn and would I like to meet her there at the same place tomorrow as she wants to know me. Kathleen's amalgamated, of course, into distractive brain chatter. And as Orne goes back to her local restaurant job, I refocus Kathleen as the mobile theme of my writing, while the busker goes retro again with The Price of Love. It was a theme often returned to by Kathleen in her attempts to incite why she was so destructively unsuited to relationships and so supportively constructive to real friendships. She told me that in neither of her two marriages had she achieved any degree of sexual pleasure. She was emphatic about that and had quickly turned to sublimating her senses through an enhanced, almost mystical bond with nature that for her scientifically revealed itself to the senses as the universal heartbeat, a cellular organism she accessed through her poetry, not descriptively, but symbiotically, as though intuiting in nature the design or transcendent shape of lyric as it came up in its pure state. There's a total absence of the urban jungle in Kathleen's poetry, an omission of all the high-tech and edgy street energies that drive my own poetry. 
leaving her work in a way excerpted from time and place and focused only on themes she considered perennial and not subject to the oxidisation of change. It leaves her poetry curiously displaced from social context and constructed exactly in that way. And if my poetry is all about the transmission of speed, then hers is its polar opposite, the slowing into autonomic trance as its method of construction. The Blakean warrior in Kathleen is not to be found in her poetry but in the combative stance of her prose. Her Blake studies, her autobiographies, her quintessential commands for poetry in defending ancient strings, springs and the inner journey of the poet, in which her indomitable conviction that poetry is a way of life and not a careerist sideline reached their optimal exponential. Nobody defended the committed poet's legacy as the unacknowledged legislator of the universe, in Shelley's phrase, harder than Kathleen, through her luminously directed prose and creative friendships that she saw as equal to her work. She repeatedly referred to universities as, quote, the enemies of imagination, seeing their role as reductive and her time spent teaching at Cambridge as creatively sterile and preferred to live on very little income, like Blake himself, rather than concede the essential freedom of the poet's role in society. I have known, never known anyone less materialistic than Kathleen. She was fortunate to own a Chelsea house got from a friend at a time when the quarter was a bohemian artist's barrio and high-end Chelsea, as yet unexploited by real estate profiteers. It was a period in the 40s when the poppy red-haired Quentin Crisp lived round the corner in Beaufort Street and became a friend of hers over tea and cafes. By the time I met Kathleen, she felt radically alienated in a square, metastatized by the greed of paramilitary financiers sealed into blacked-out jeeps as mobile fortresses. If Kathleen felt understandably angular to the Thatcher greed politics of the 80s, in which hedge funding diagnostics went viral and the arts were relegated to the ministerial backyard at a time when she desperately needed funding for her idea of a Temenos Academy, then her own natural resilience hardened. Driven by the notion <laughs> that Temenos should not only exist as a document expressing her beliefs in what she called, quote, the learning of the imagination, she conceived of acquiring a London building that would serve as a physical academy for students to study degree courses in the more esoterically based doctrines that she believed comprised a recognisable substrate to the collective psyche. What she looked for initially was private patronage, an exhaustive route in which tentative promises never properly materialised and the pursuit of which ate into her creative working time, as well as increasing the frequency of her angina attacks that when I witnessed them would last for periods of five or ten minutes acutely discomforting pain. She started taking the prescription drug nitroglycerin to prevent chest pain, a nitrate vasodilator with a biological half-life of three minutes taken orally, and this brought considerable relief to the alarming pain that would sometimes inhibit her activities. In order to help fund the magazine, she sold off her valuable first editions of Thomas Taylor's translations of the Neoplatonists, the text that Blake dipped into, poets dip rather than read. So too, her personalised David Jones lettering and the design of her name that she kept framed above her worktop in the living room. Unstoppable in her conviction to concretise her beliefs, she was establishing an academy to house them. She prioritised Temenos over her own work, one of the demanding undertakings being an almost global correspondence. She was a great and untiring letter writer, mostly by hand. And despite the fact I saw her every few weeks, I received regular and often long letters from her in support of her beliefs or in the encouragement of my writing. She gave herself fully and generously in her letters to friends and formidably and vehemently to her enemies. She took fierce issue with detractors and welcomed combat in the way Blake defiantly put down opponents. 
Kathleen had her internalised black book of enemies, mostly drawn from the literary world, making little or no allowance for their coexistence <coughs> in her lifetime. She particularly disliked a genre of mainstream British fiction. I won't use the names, the sort of wallpaper fiction she termed discursive trivia. She tended with exceptions like Proust, Faulkner and Patrick White, who she strongly advocated to regard fiction as a secondary resource to poetry, in which her frontline antipathies were largely directed at the Auden generation and to the misanthropic provincialism of Philip Larkin and the small realistic fieldwork of a poetry influenced by him. She repeatedly called their effort social reportage, seeing it as simply describing reality as reality to no other advantage to the reader. And if there's no exchange of reality, then writing is simply boring. Words should be chemical messengers and not unaltered signs. During the 90s, and considering herself underread, Kathleen undertook the gargantuan task of reading all of Gibbon's Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, the entirety of Mathers's translation of the Arabian Nights, the Rig Feeders, Ezra Pound's Cantos, Great Choice, from cover to cover, Golding's Ovid, uh, directed to that by Pound, and a continuous stream of books on the esoteric and occult scientists gifted her by admirers. Review copies of books sent her by publishers were usually binned or sold on in piles to Chelsea Antique Books around the corner at World's End. I'm back writing in Leicester Square. Tomorrow, yesterday or today, it's all the same. I'm an alien tourist, and Orn is on a lunch break like she's never left the last one. Spotting me, she comes over and asks if I'm writing a story, and I say, yes, everything's a story. And she takes her shoes off and shows me the damage done to her feet by waitressing. The money's shit, but she can't get another job. Disproportionately, I show her the damage done to my right index finger by writing, and she offers to massage it. I'm a strange attractor. I seem always to have this collusive effect on strangers. It starts to rain. It always does in Leicester Square. And I tell her I'll see her yesterday, or do I mean tomorrow? It's all the same when you're writing. I go off to Patisserie Valerie on Soho's old Compton Street to continue this, and she back to work. I've deliberately avoided referencing Kathleen's autobiographies as backup his autobiography is usually a metafiction for the life you would like to have lived but never did. In other words, it's mostly lies. Having just written one called Bandit Poet, I know the trick. It makes no difference anyway. It's how it's written counts. Nobody can validate facts as they belong to a past that is unverifiable. Can you really remember what happened tomorrow? In a very real sense, 47 Portland Square, as Kathleen's modus operandi, was her London hub, the domestic locale or slice of the city that provided her with a physical platform to oppose the creepy indifference of external politics with a counterposed inner hierarchy of symbols she conceived as Golganusa, the city within a city that Blake's Jerusalem argues as a reality. She engaged with the city through a busy social life, both at home and through attending functions in her capacity as Blake's secretary or a missary. It was a heroic quest that set her apart from most of her contemporaries, the idea that Blake's world is this world only seen differently, and your purchase on it is through perceiving it imaginatively as a quality of inner space. Kathleen was never pedantic about her knowledge of Blake's uncompromising affirmations of visionary reality. Rather, she shared generously in conversation, colouring a point often casually by a line that fitted, and often in me, to me in relation to work, eternity is in love with the productions of time. In other words, don't waste a moment because it won't come up again. As the story comes from Thomas Gilchrist, who as Blake's first biographer pinched up as much of his Soho DNA as possible, that once stopping off for a drink of porter in a Soho pub, Blake was confronted by the angel Gabriel and reproached for taking time out 
and immediately returned to his work engraving plates for Flaxman's Hesiod, which was published in 1817. And for Kathleen, there was almost continuous rumble of emotional war with her family, all of which was run by me in great detail to approve psychological support for grievances carved into her tissues. Kathleen simply wouldn't tolerate the fact that neither of her children, Anna or James, gave her work the seriousness she felt it demanded. While becoming a personal friend of Anna's, I saw little of James, except for an ugly domestic row that occurred on one of my visits, when James, partly skewed by Kathleen's liberal slugs of scotch, exploded on provocation into telling his mother he'd never read one of her books and never intended to, something that led to a violent row with James storming out and slamming the door. Unabashed by James's aggression, Kathleen told me that she was to blame for having partially disowned him, but was understandably affronted by what she called his denial of everything she stood for. At the time, Anna was temporarily living at Kathleen's and working at Watkins Bookshop in Cecil Court, a place with which Kathleen had a long and close association with its founder, Nigel Watkins, and through, and through the shop's importance to her in sourcing the esoteric books essential to her work, many of which lived spines facing out on the shelves of her living room. As irascibly incontrovertible as her spiritual mentor, Blake, with whom she shared an almost osmotic empathy. Her reserves of compassion were correspondingly inexhaustible, and trouble in my life in the form of breakdowns, the suicides of close friends, and the general emotional mess that is part of life were taken on by her with a generosity of support and psychological knowledge supplied with unconditional love. She was quite unshockable. You could tell her anything and she would incite it at source or find a parallel in the experience of friends and take it to depth and support grief or pain with solicitous concern. Death as a subject came up often, and she was at all times afraid to die, both as the termination of her work and identity, but also because she feared the existence of an afterlife as a system not supporting rest, but the continuity of unresolved aspects of personality. It may be that individuals overattached to a particularly self-identified and unrepeatable creative curve feel the loss of it more than those who are perhaps easily collectivised into their material role in society. If your gifts are special, you correspondingly value and fear their extinction. Death as hard as you are letting go what will never come again in that particular physical form created specifically for that purpose in a moment in time. Kathleen was acutely aware of that, and her greatness came in part from acknowledging her transience and in attempting to build a legacy that would continue without her. She asked me from the earliest stages of our friendship if I would be one of the persons there when she came to die, and I was with her at the hospital hours before her death, when looking at me directly in the eyes blue iris on blue. She recited the passage from Blake on mercy, pity, peace and love as her last words to me. She was still expected to live when I went back home. I'd taken her a bunch of pink peonies and it was Thetis Blacker who was with her at the end, helping her let go into whatever death means. Kathleen loved life as it bounces on the senses. If you took her flowers, she inhaled the whole bunch as though her life depended on it. And loved English garden flowers that she cultivated, scented roses, fritillaries, mahonia and mimosa, camellias, lily of the valley, poppies, cornflowers, all of which she grew. And particularly giving me bunches of marzipan-scented, jubilantly yellow mimosa on its arrival in the corners of spring. Her room was never without flowers, usually brought by friends, including myself, and observed by her pigment for pigment, inviting from her sometimes a line from Swedenborg on singularity, quote, No substance, state, or thing in the created universe can ever be the same or identical with any other. In her life, 
She combined the scientific with the aesthetic, in other words, the active ingredients of good writing, aware always of the adaptive interface between inner and outer realities as the site of poetry, and that the great unlimited inner spaces were there to be mined as inexhaustible resources. Blake's mythically constructed cosmogenies, realities to him, but often locking the reader out of his complex systems, read to me like non-tech sci-fi, a mapping of warring exoplanets in which rocketry is replaced by mythic volatiles in a chaos reddened by apocalypse or psychosis. Kathleen's philosophical and metaphysical expositions of Blake's schematic approach genius, but they are, of course, individual interpretations coloured by a lifetime's immersion in his furious, chiliastic vision. She certainly inherited from Blake an aggressive antagonism to any faction critical of her policies. Intensely focused, she wrote papers, essays, reviews, introductions fast and often without reference as her knowledge was fluently consummate and there on demand. She wrote poems in diminishing number, longhand into journals, and would read me new work always in exchange for mine. Like all good writers, she was simple in her method and eloquent in the results, seeing as I do, as natural as oxygen. While she cared nothing for material rewards, she was concerned about her literary reputation, repeatedly asking me if I thought her work would outlive her as value to future generations. Who survives is rather like trying to select a single raindrop in a whizzing downpour. Who knows where the sparkler lands? And she'd tell me, quote, all of my life I've worked like a black for no result, and the whiskey would usually soften or blur the edges of her jangly dilemma. Like all creative people who hope in some way to be remembered, she faced the excruciating crisis of having to let go work she could no longer control or rehabilitate in her favour. And of course it's not easy walking out with no future physical claim on work you've spent a lifetime perfecting. Of course it pissed her off, as the prospect does me, or anyone who does something special that may be imported into the future. For some reason, Kathleen's big snarl was with Sylvia Plath's posthumous afterlife. For me, arguably and indubitably one of the greatest of 20th century poets. Her blitzkrieg of stunning imagery and stripped-down confessional focus, pushing her so far down the sliding line of posterity that she will never go away. Kathleen was for some reason in full-on contention with Plath over a posthumous merit she intended to succeed and refused to read Plath properly, her crushing put-down, trading off her conviction that Plath's reputation was secured more by her suicide than the legitimate property of her electrifying poetry that puts a dopamine wallop into the brain. But Kathleen wouldn't have it, and while she made allowance for Robert Lowell's documentation of manic breakdown in his seminal life studies on the grounds of his sweeping mythic archetypes into his disruptive mania, no such allowance was granted Sylvia Plath. All the more pathologised hysteria of Anne Sexton as still another suicide in the escalating personal tragedies that littered the pre-millennial build of late 20th century poetry. It wasn't only that she wouldn't have it, but she wouldn't read it. Diane Mikoski, Rochelle Owens, Adrian Risch, Bernadette Meyer, Denise Levratov, Veronica Forrest Thompson, she wouldn't give them existence or acknowledge their place in the atmosphere. She complained instead that she herself had given too little time to poetry and too much to prose, and that now it was irreversible. She set about assembling her collective writings on Yeats for Leanne Miller's Dolman Press, the last book he was to oversee the publication in 1986 as he was dying of cancer and sent him a box of champagne to help palliate an end narrowing on him the following year. Kathleen was dissatisfied with her own input in that book, telling me that Francis Yates, whose books like The Art of Memory and Giordano Brino and The Hermetic Tradition she so admired, would have researched the esoteric side much deeper, but that she wanted to bring her Yates studies to a conclusion 
as she had sort of fallen out of love with his work romantically, describing the first drafts of his poems to me as pedestrian. Blake, on the other hand, remained irreducibly, iconically her undiminished avatar, shining a light into her intrinsically and how she perceived London, the alternative one he'd built into its financial towers and floating archipelagos of office space. She looked for the diagram of his Jerusalem in her daily life and told me of the times when a delusionally schizoid David Gascoigne would take refuge with her and set out to, at night to walk across the city, returning at dawn as the amphetamine he'd taken wore off and telling her sometimes everything in the room had turned gold as part of his alchemical quest to literally see the sun at midnight. In the early 50s, the sustained chaos his schizophrenia <coughs> brought into her life led to a severance in their relationship that lasted for a decade, and again she blamed herself repeatedly for having forced him out of her life as his illness grew to intrude on her disciplined work. Kathleen was instrumental in keeping David away from toxic psychiatry, insisting quite rightly he should see only Jungian analysts and incite his scrambled, paranoid symptoms archetypally as the therapy best suited to his particular visionary type. She told me how David would lie on the bed all day, burnt out by conflicting radio in his head, voices that opposed his creative processes with often brutally obscene intervention. Apart from a generic predisposition to schizophrenia, David was also suffering episodes of amphetamine psychosis that had him proclaim the second coming in the streets. When in the mid-80s I completed my first non-fiction book, Madness, the Price of Poetry, and a Kathleen's request read her parts of the book in process, she again selflessly and generously informed Peter Owen of the book's deeply empathetic focus, advising him to publish it and initialising a long and productive association with his publishing house that was the result of my continuing to publish fiction and non-fiction books with him as an outstanding independent publisher, known always <clears throat> for pushing the edge. And while Peter, over the years, made regular requests to Kathleen for a book of essays, she never took him up on it, reluctant to assemble a new book after the very low sales of the inner journey of the poet that she told me didn't even amount to 300 copies. I think, like most poets, she felt she was waiting, writing for no one, but was undeterred in her conviction. She was emphatic in telling me that at the moment of death, the question asked is whether you have honoured your purpose or calling, and she was clear she'd attempted her best in giving her all. Had Kathleen found gay men more conducive company, partly due to her own psychological androgyny, than falling in love unrequitedly with Gavin Maxwell, a neighbour of Portland Square, and feeling, of course, physically rejected, only further compounded her sense of inconsolable loss. Although she was willing to concede that her principal romance was, of course, her Blakean studies, and that human relations lived in the shadow of that luminously personalised nimbus. To me, she always shone as the brightest thing in the room, her aura a solid shape of condensed purple, blue, green and orange arabesques coalescing into a molecular cone, comparable sometimes to the lurid sunset over world's end just down the road from her. There were boxes of organic vegetables arrived from Highgrove every two weeks. Kathleen used to mark up passages of literature for Prince Charles to read on flights and was his sort of unofficial literary guru. She used to ask me to read the personal handwritten letters in blue ink that he sent her on crested paper, some of them relating to his misconceived marriage to Diana and often carrying highly sensitive information about his parents considering his attraction to the green world and his superficial knowledge of world religion as deeply injurious to his media profile, writing in a memorable phrase that he would never be king by reason of his parents considering him hazardly unconventional and, in his own words, mad. Charles's secretary would on occasions finance the publication of Temenos, conditional to a piece by Charles appearing in the issue, heavily edited and in parts rewritten by Kathleen. Like me, 
Kathleen lived in part from selling her papers to her archive, and Charles's letters were carefully concealed in a folder for this purpose of preservation. In the week succeeding her death, MI5 entered her house at Porton Square, temporarily occupied by Liz, her granddaughter, and stole the files for the obvious reason of their potentially toxic contents being leaked to the press. It's an odd juxtaposition to think of Blake's secretary being under the surveillance of secret intelligence, but Kathleen believed in an ideal hierarchical world in which poets should be patronised by princes, even though her objective to secure a property from Charles as a composite Temenos Academy repeatedly failed to find concretisation. No longer writing very much poetry, she bought an Irish black wool cape to assert what she called a poetic presence at social functions. Like me, she believed you should look like what you do as the physical adjunct to your art. My long afternoons with her comprised an extraordinary, privileged, hands-on education of shared ideas. Disagreement with Kathleen on my part never occurred. I listened and pushed in my ideas where they seemed to connect. We spoke regularly of aliens, I'm one, or visitors from the future as already here in the transitioning morph of one gene into another, in the sense that in a seminal essay on inner space as the pioneering province of science fiction, J.G. Ballard memorably named Earth as the only alien planet. What for me are aliens? Well, for Kathleen, the archetypal states realised in Blake's visionary schematic of the human city. One essential that Kathleen and I always considered paramount was that poets need luxuries and not necessities. In other words, expensive clothes, books, booze, scents, taxis, teas, jewellery, etc. The aesthetic always overriding the practical in optimising sensory pleasure at the expense of boring material investment. Kathleen only used Roger et Gallet soaps, something I do too, selecting her favourite flower of osmanthus, or on a soberer note, green tea. For recipients of hand-labelled jars, she also made <clears throat> the crunchiest, most citric, tangy, whisky-tinctured orange marmalade, her intuitively blended mixology being done <clears throat> in the autumn as a deep umber treat. Sometimes, sometimes in the late afternoon when I was visiting her, we'd be joined by Norman, whose role in Kathleen's life was to bring seriously priced black vintage to the evening, wines that Norman treated as intelligent entities, uncorking and leaving to room temperature sometimes for two hours before pouring. Norman handled wine as an experienced nose and took me independently to restaurants that nurtured his sort of broody reds, neither of us eating anything, but just concentrating on the wine's variable, coercive moods. There's still another of Kathleen's special gay friends singularly devoted to mystic pathways. Norman in his bespoke charcoal pinstripes held bottles like a snake handler looking to contain a red serpentine muscle escaping the bottle. Indefatigably courageous and generally well despite intermittent panic brought on by angina, Kathleen lived into her 90s without any form of home help, fully active and singularly focused on consolidating her belief in Blake's expansively visionary perception in which imaginative reality supersedes secondary or quantitative existence. I never knew her depressed, despondent sometimes at the refutal of her work by mainstream critics, but always above it with an overview that the inner cosmogony star-mapped by Blake existed totally independent of reductionist policies. For Kathleen, inner had become a total immersive reality, a space into which to die as a continuity of the state in which he lived and believed. And of enduring importance to me, she introduced me to her close friend and teacher, Prince Kumar, who continues to this day to be a light cone in my life, the guide to all inner signposting through the application of science to spirituality, 
never separating the transcendent from the human crisis of living and interacting with the likes of Allen Ginsberg, William Burroughs and Christopher Isherwood in helping them reconcile the necessary underside to creative experience to its counterposed higher state. As Blake so appositely stated, quote, there is no thought without mind. So Kumar recognises that dark and light are interdependent in the place they occupy in creative experience. Otherwise, there is a seriously defective imbalance in the poetic genome. Those who aspire to, aspire to higher consciousness reach it through journeying by way of the underbelly into a more realised design. If you always sit on top of the mountain, you miss the struggle in getting there. Kathleen worked hard on herself in her later years to try and unify the necessary symbiosis of good and bad in her life, both being indispensable to the human condition. She trusted Blake as having the right mass. She once wrote down for me on the spot in my troubles, quote from Blake, Learn, therefore, O sisters, to distinguish the eternal human that walks about among the stones of fire in bliss and woe, alternate from those states or world in which the spirit travels. You can't have one without the other, and she anticipated in her own way, if it exists, what she called an equally troubled afterlife. If the individual survives death with some sort of parallel awareness, and I hope Kathleen encounters Blake, for she gave most of her life to him and the teachings he won in such a hard, lonely way as an assumed, unintelligible psychotic. I go back and sit down in Leicester Square. Where else do I go? I write a poem called Don't You Bother Me about my own alienation in the crowd. A stringy guy who's lost half of his flesh comes up to me and says he's got everything I need. And I tell him I've got my own drug poetry before he dematerializes like he's walked off into a parallel reality. You meet them all there like today's tomorrow. Most writers only encounter writing when they work. I meet strangers who often become friends. Orn shows up after 30 minutes carrying a little plastic lunchbox and having told her I'm vegan, she tells me she's made something especially for me. She shows me her damaged feet again like she's been treading on plums. I've almost finished my poem, and she asks me what it's about, and I just say, me. There's a damp chill in the air, and I can see from build in the sky it's going to rain, and my jacket is too expensive to ruin. I need some strong tea as riding shreds my nerve terminals, and I ask her if she'd like to join me for tea and cake. What else do you do mid-afternoon? and you've just finished writing a poem. And although she hardly knows me, she links her arm through mine and says, hurry, it's going to rain. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Jeremy, for a talk which was poetic, dramatic, and controversial mm. in a way that I think Kathleen would thoroughly have enjoyed. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you very much. I'm going to finish by reading to you a poem which I think is very apposite, particularly to Greville, who is such a great admirer of Robert Graves. I can only describe Robert Graves as a magician. Kathleen, too, was a big admirer of his book, The White Goddess. So, as we're in the winter, I'm going to read you a poem which will tell you everything magical you can't comprehend but know by Robert Graves called to Juan at the winter solstice. There is one story and one story only that will prove worth your telling. Whether as learned bard or gifted child, to it all lines or lesser gods belong that startle with their shining such common stories as they stray into. Is it of trees you tell, their months and virtue, of strange beasts that beset you, of birds that croak at you the triple will, or of the zodiac 
and how slow it turns below the boreal crown, prison of all true kings that ever reigned. Water to water, arc again to arc, from woman back to woman, so each new victim treads unfalteringly the never altered circuit of his fate, bringing twelve peers as witness both to his starry rise and starry fall. Or is it of the virgin's silver beauty or fish below the thighs? She in her left hand holds a leafy quince when with her right she crooks a finger smiling. How may the king hold back? Royally then he barters life for love. Or at the undying snake from chaos hatched, whose coils contain the ocean, into whose chops with naked sword he springs, then in black water, tangled by the reeds, battles three days and nights to be spewed up beside her scalloped shore. Much snow is falling, falling. Winds roar hollowly, the owl hoots from the elder. Fear in your heart cries to the loving cup, sorrow to sorrow as the sparks fly upward, the log groans and confesses there is one story and one story only. Dwell on her graciousness, dwell on her smiling. Do not forget what flowers the great or trampled down in ivy time. Her brow was creamy as the crested wave. Her sea blue eyes were wild, but nothing promised that is not performed. That's Robert Gray's to Juan at the Winter Solstice. So you can ask me if, if Stephen thinks there's enough time, a few questions if you want to, about Kathleen or me writing in Leicester Square, whatever you choose. <laughs> Just, was the Helen Sutherland, yes. who looked after her children, was, was she the person who David Jones... Yes, that's David right, David same connection, yeah. that's right. Yeah, Kathleen loved David Jones very deeply. And used to tell me stories of visiting him and how he lived on grapefruit and whiskey and boiled eggs because he was highly agoraphobic, of course, and could hardly go out. <laughs> Poets need those things, <laughs> particularly the whiskey. Did her son ever come round? I mean, did they resolve it in the end? Oh, I don't think there was anything to resolve. Those things can't be resolved. They just go on. They die when you die. You said towards the beginning there was very little materialism yes. in, in her. Yes. Some of the things you said towards the end um, conflicted with that a bit. Now I was suggesting that poets like myself and her much prefer luxuries to necessities and so whenever Kathleen had money she bought luxuries and not necessities. She would very often give me money and say to me go and buy a beautiful scarf or go and buy a Roger Galley soap. That's what poets live by and believe in. The rest is immaterial. So that wasn't materialism. <laughs> it is materialism, but it's deserved materialism. <laughs> <laughs> poets deserve continuous spoiling and luxuries. Of course they do. No, it's an aesthetic experience. Yes, I of course it is. I love flowers and it's a nice Of flowers. course. You know, we've forgotten these old pleasures. Exactly. And they make the day. <laughs> Whiskey? Yeah, of course. Only <laughs> <laughs> good stuff, though. What work have you written about Kathleen apart from that lecture? I don't, that's not a lecture, it's a talk. I never give lectures. Because um, I hate lectures. Um, I don't think I've written about Kathleen, no. That's uh, something I've always personalised within myself because every molecule in me is filled with her gold and she gave me so much that it sparkles every time I write a word. She had that particular ability for the friend she loved to 
give you this huge Lakeian gold rush of energies. So I carry that all the time. I thank her every minute for what she gave me. Huge friendship, supports, understanding of breakdowns, whatever, whatever. Kathleen would have been better than any psychiatrist or psychologist that could ever have lived because she understood the whole archetypal connection and the human pain of which she was full of herself, of course. So she understood pain deeply and she was quite unshockable. You could tell her anything about anything and she would incite it because being shocked isn't part of poetry. It's part of, I don't know, academe, but certainly not poetry. Does anyone know what happened to the letters from Prince John's? I guess MI5 um, probably they went into dematerialization, Jerry, I guess. They were interesting letters. I mean, they weren't particularly original or anything of that nature. They were mainly com letters complaining about the straight jacketing of his own emotional life, um, green interests. She always asked me to read them. Um, she liked to share those with me, as she did most very confidential things. No one had copies of them? Right? No. She used to sell, like me, everything she wrote to archives, and so she was planning those to go on. She received very beautiful letters, handwritten letters, from the poet Robert Duncan, which were much more interesting. Robert Duncan's handwriting alone was something quite extraordinary. And she managed to get Robert Duncan to do some versions of the poet Rumi for Temenos. Um, he asked for no money for doing it. He said, just send me an esoteric book that you might get from Watkins or something. Hmm. I want to ask you about, did you ever read Prince Charles' poetry or his attempts at it? <laughs> no, he never sent any poetry. Kathleen's job was to, because he was too busy, she used to mark up passages in books for him to read on air flights. So she'd mark up some Blake or Shelley or whatever it was to try and open him out a bit to a world in which he was partially interested or assumed he had to be a little bit interested in. So that's all she did. Yes, he never wrote any poetry. What he did write for Demonos was occasional ecological essays of a very boring nature um, which she would have to heavily edit and partially rewrite but that got money for the publication because then his secretary would pay for the printing of what was a beautiful magazine and very expensive to produce so he was very helpful and indirectly in that respect but mercifully he didn't try to write poetry <laughs> Yes it starts about a question, really, but uh, just an observation. I liked very much your presentation of Kathleen as you knew her. I am myself the son of Michael Roberts and Janet Adam Smith, who, of course, were long-time friends of Kathleen's. Mm, yes. Uh, my mother, who... Lived almost as long as Kathleen did. Yes. Uh, to the end, regarded herself half teasingly as your boring old friend. They would see each other sometimes, much as once a week. Mm -hmm. if my mother was dropping in after going to the Scots Church in Columbus, in Bond Street, and then going on mm. to Bolton Square. Right. And. Uh, I'd just like to say that while I think that everything you said about Kathleen is, I, I recognise that she had perhaps a little more room, at least at certain times of day, mm. certain seasons of the year, yes. for boring old friends. Yes, or I even, have. <laughs> even uh, the um, people of her generation, whom in a way she discarded or put at a distance uh, after all William Empson uh, yes. Humphrey Jennings yes. uh, and I think he recognised it Empson of course was himself a true poet yes absolutely he had been Humphrey Jennings also clearly had the, the poetic fire yes and she was very good in making time for the Jennings family 
after Humphrey was killed in 1950, I think it was. Yes, which would have been an element of her compassion, of course. That's right. And she did a very good Boxing Day party with children. Mm -hmm. So i just like to... Thank you for telling me those things. That I'd was just like to say that mm. she was, in fact, perfectly believable to a child, at least. Yes. A teenager. As a mother. Yes. This is not a role mm. that she mm. particularly enjoyed that. Yes. But she nonetheless had what I think we can call mm -hmm. maternal instincts. Yes. Yes. Pompous. Absolutely. So that was really all I wanted to say about oh, but thank you very much. And kind of trimming. Yes. Or, or it adds. Handy. It adds a very useful aspect, definitely. Thank you very much for that insight, which was before I knew Kathleen. Yes. So thank you very much mm. for giving me some past in that very personal way. Thank mm. you so much. I have a small anecdote. Yes. I was doing a book of um, an anthology, and I wanted to include one of her poems. Yes. And she was very generous. And everyone else who I included in the anthology asked for money. So I said, you know, how much are you going to charge? And she said, nothing. Yes. She said, because I want my poetry to be widely read. That's right. So, That's a very nice yeah. experience, typical of her yeah. and her incredible generosity yeah. on very little money. She was enormously generous. Mm. And she would give you, if you looked at anything or admired anything, she would give it to you straight away on the spot. Um, so it was wise not to admire too much at <laughs> on visiting her because she would give you any books that you looked at and liked um, and all sorts of things. She was quite extraordinary. Yes? Um, sorry, I might have got off a bit. Off a bit fast. Yeah. Did, did you tell us uh, how she approached uh, the prince? Did you tell us that? Or if you didn't, what came into her mind that she was contacting to support? Well, her? you know, she very much lived in the hope that when she formed Temenos, where we are here now as the Damanos Academy talk, that she would have an actual building in which students could come and study more esoteric sciences, more imaginative things than they can at normal, boring universities. So very much her aim was to try and secure the patronage of Charles or somebody like him to give her a building. And she was very disappointed when a building that Charles owned near Regent's Park was, wasn't allocated to her, but he actually sold it on. So she felt very let down on that thing. He also used to send her the same brooch every birthday. Um, exactly the same one which came from Gerard's, year after year after year. She used to say to me, I've got the same brooch again. <laughs> why, why did he contact him then? I mean, because he, no, no, he, he contacted her. She, she took over from somebody called Lawrence van der Post, who was Charles' spiritual advisor. When Lawrence van der Post died, Charles asked Kathleen if he would become her sort of literary spiritual guru. She was unpaid for it, but given organic vegetables, and invited up to Highgrove and all of that. But she just tried to point him in directions that would you know, give him a bit more insight into a world that he was probably denied by his position into reading things that could kind of blow his mind, but probably didn't, but in some aspect got to him. <laughs> Can't imagine Charles having his mind blown, but uh, <laughs> yeah. Yes, we have a question over there. Yes? So, um, Charles Dickens was quite a great lover of black water. Yes, and, uh, that's great. <laughs> he, um, always struck me as someone who sort of danced in that world of, I suppose we could call it a mental illness, but it danced in the world of mm. not quite here in this world, but not. And do you suppose it was her love of Blake that almost made her a sympathetic ear to someone like David Gascoigne, who also suffered from mental illness and saw a, almost a kinship in the two of them? Yes, very much. And I think, you know, Poetry is inseparable from mental illness and breakdown. It's part of a journey. And almost all poets have breakdowns on that journey, like Robert Graves has put into metaphor in that poem I read you. It is a journey. And of course, yes, 
David Gascoigne, who I knew very well and was exceedingly beautiful as a young person, almost like a god fallen out of the sky, he was so beautiful. David had schizophrenic breakdowns, voices, um, and was totally marvellous. I did a lot of performances with David. I used to go to Liberties and buy him beautiful silk ties because David loved ties and always dressed in pinstripe suits and beautiful ties and shirts. Kathleen had looked after David in a certain period of time because David had no money, no job, never could have ever held a job. Um, and so he periodically stayed with her in periods of bad breakdown and lack of money. David was patronised by Peter Watson, also a friend of Kathleen's, who was a very rich gay millionaire who put up money for people like David when he needed it. But David wore velvet suits and had no money. When I say poets need luxuries, not necessities. <laughs> Of course, of, of course. Life. And Blake clearly had undergone breakdown, but of course it wasn't probably diagnosable then, so it was put into the extraordinary visionary content of his work, of course, rather than what some diagnostic psychiatrists would call psychosis. It was simply unleashed as a storm of energy. Well, I think Kathleen. Uh, mm, I think Kathleen, you know, would have been sympathetic to almost all states, but you know, she, the androgynous state she looked for, wasn't so much transgender as kind of you know, the embodiment of masculine and feminine in one body, um, unaltered surgically or anything of that nature. She saw that as the real archetype, the sort of Socratic archetype whereby the male femininity is stronger than the female masculinity, which was very much her argument as to why, in her mind, I'm not saying in my mind at all, but in her mind she saw men as more creatively productive for that reason. Now, there's a huge counter-argument against that. And I was once at a talk she gave when a lot of women walked out precisely because of those views. But she remained undeterred about that. Um, she saw the male androgyne, the feminized male, as the carrier of a particular psychological journey that she herself was on and admired. But yes, she would have taken transgender into enormous sympathy, of course. She would have related it back to a particular archetype with the Byzantine or the Roman emperors who treasured eunuchs, etc., etc. Um, she would have seen its whole historic context. Yeah, definitely. Any last question? So, thank you so much. Once more to thank Jeremy and for me to thank Gravel and for me to thank Stephen talk. Overy for inviting me. And I hope to come back next year, as I do once a year. Delighted and, to have you. And perhaps resume as David always. Bowie, which I did last year for the Terminus Academy. Why not? The Great Star Man, <laughs> part two. <laughs> thank, thank you. Thank you.